there's anything I love, it's luxury centers. <laughs> when I get my privilege card, I know what I'm gonna get me to. Secretary. What do you want a secretary? You planning on becoming an executive? Oh, I just need one. About this tall. <laughs> yeah? Why don't you give it a rest? Please? Yeah, I uh, tried to order some books, and they sent me this notice, said I had to appear at the uh, center personally. That's right. This is our circulation unit. You can make your choice here or by catalog. There must be some mistake. The books you've ordered are classified and have been transcribed and summarized. Well, who summarizes them? I suppose the computer summarizes them. <laughs> what do you need books for? I just want to study up on some things. You could go to the computer center where the real librarians transcribe the books. But we have all the edited versions in our catalog. Anything I think you'd want. Well, let's see then. This is not a library, and you're really not a librarian. I'm only a clerk, that's right. I'm sorry about it, really. And, and the books are really in computer banks being summarized. Where is that? Well, there's a computer bank in Washington. The biggest is in Geneva. That's a nice place to visit. Yeah. I guess that's where all the books are now. Yeah, well, thank you. Jonathan E. or Hartman E. Oh, sorry, things are in the mess. The Rollerball Champion. Ha ah, ha, wonderful. Not many people come to see us, you know. We're not easy to talk to, Zero and I. Mm. A little confused again here today. This is embarrassing. It's embarrassing to misplace things. Oh, you misplace some data? Hmm. The whole of the 13th century. Place the computers, several conventional computers. We can't find them. We're always moving things around, getting organized. My assistants and I. But this, this is Zero's fault. Zero. He's the world's file cabinet. Yeah, pity. Poor old 13th century. Well, come along now. You want to get started, don't you? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. This way. Now. But we've lost those computers with all of the 13th century in them. Not much in the century, just Dante and a few corrupt popes. But it's so distracting and annoying. You. Unlimited restrictions here, of course, but uh, you have to come so, so many times. It uh, all takes such, such effort. Do the uh, executives still come here? Oh, they used to, some of them. What about the books? Books, books, oh, no, they're all changed, all transcribed, all information is here. We zero, of course. He's the central brain, the world's brain. Fluid mechanics, fluidics. He's liquid, you see. His water's touch. All knowledge. Everything we ask has become so, ah, so 
complicated now. Each thing we asked this morning, we wanted to know something about the 13th century. He flows out into all our storage systems. He considers everything. He's become so ambiguous now, as if he knows nothing at all. Um, could you tell me something about the corporate wars? Wars, wars. Oh, yes, of course, we have them all here. Punic War, Prussian War, Peloponnesian War, Crimean War, Wars of the Roses. One doesn't perhaps recall them in sequence, but uh, corporate wars. Mm. Well, Zero will, or can, I'm sure, tell you anything. A memory pool, you see. He's supposed to tell us where things are and what they might possibly mean. Looks here, though. A visitor. Jonathan E., the rollerball champion. You filed away a lot of data on him. Do you remember? Does it answer you? Oh, yes. It speaks. Uh, it finds things and loses them. And confuses itself. Ask anything. You found it for you. Section of lock. Won't you, Zero? All right. Uh, I'd like. Uh, I'd like uh, some information about corporate decisions, uh, how they're made, and who makes them. Zero. You heard the question. Answer him. Negative. You don't have to give him a full political briefing. Answer. Negative. This is Jonathan E. He has to know. Make it simple. Answer. Corporate decisions are made by corporate executives. Corporate executives make corporate I know we have decisions. the answers. We do have knowledge them. converts They're the to waters power. of history. Energy equals oh, genius. Meaning. Power I is not Genius is energy. I corporate entities, entities control, control fundamental, I have fundamental to elements answer. of economic technology. life, technology, <laughs> capital, and labor, and markets. Corporate decisions are made by corporate executives. The 13th century negative, 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 after having scanned them so they can be read by a computer. No overdue fines here. As soon as the truck is empty, library workers load it up again with more books to digitize, part of an ambitious program that so far has scanned 12 million books at many libraries. The goal is to scan up to 40 million. That's a tall order for Daniel Clancy, an engineer and the director of Google Books. Google said our mission is to organize um, uh, all the world's information. He says the primary purpose of all the digitizing is to make books searchable. The repository of our cultural and societal and his history um, is really embodied in books. Um, but when you search the web, you're not searching books. Many of these books were not, are not digitally available. Clancy showed me how books are now appearing ever more frequently on Google searches. Every time you search Google, you're searching 12 million books. They were looking for this arcane, it's called Court of Admirality. So this is a very obscure, you know, long tail query that this person was looking for something, okay? And now when you click through, you see this book that what you're seeing up here is actually a public domain book that we currently let this user see the entire book of and then he can also download a copy of a book, and it's free. Stanford, the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Michigan have signed agreements with Google, 
authorizing the firm to scan their books. Michael Keller, the Stanford librarian, says it's a valuable program. The indexing of every word in every one of the books would allow us to get more out of the books. Another goal was to make more accessible the contents of these libraries to others around the United States and indeed around the world. While Stanford digitizes some books on its own for special projects using a fairly slow and complicated Swiss-made scanner, Google uses its own proprietary system, which it wouldn't allow us to film. The Google project has provoked loud criticism among some academics, authors, and rival high-tech companies, some of whom have sued to halt or at least modify it. Gary Reback is a Silicon Valley attorney who represents the Open Book Alliance, whose members include Microsoft and Amazon.com. He predicts that Google will start without charging for what it digitizes, but eventually will impose hefty fees. What Google is proposing here is not like any library you've ever been to. It's not a public library, it's a private library. And it's being run for profit, big profits. Google is going to charge university scholars, ordinary people, even school children to get access to books that Google copied without the permission of the publisher or the author. Current books whose copyrights are intact and the copyright holders are known are not in dispute. Publishers must give their permission for those books or portions of them to be put online. Books in the public domain whose copyrights have expired are fair game for any digitizer and currently you can download many of them for free. The problems arise over so-called orphan books, out of print but still in copyright, where the current holder of that copyright is unknown. While there are a lot of them, they don't get read very often. What happens when you digitize these books and make them accessible on the net is that they get a lot more use. People can find the stuff. Ten times more use than formerly was recorded. Selling digital copies of those books then could become profitable and the fight is over who gets the money. But Google insists its plans and its investment, which it won't disclose, are not based on profits. Google hopes to benefit from it by improving our search, and we expect that we will make some money as we sell the books. But the motivation is not the money we're going to make from selling books, because if you look at what we're investing, it's far greater than that. Attorney Reback doesn't buy that at all. He says Google reached a tentative exclusive settlement with authors and publishers, giving them part of the profits that gives Google a lucrative monopoly. The problem is the way Google has gone about this to make themselves the exclusive supplier. We have proposed that we take Google's set of digital copies and we have them licensed to four or five other companies and that would mean that there'd be competition. Google's alleged monopoly also disturbs Pam Samuelson, a law professor at the University of California, Berkeley, who teaches copyright law. She contends that the agreement reached last October between Google and publishers and authors does not protect the public or universities who use those books. There really are not checks and balances in the agreement about uh, about pricing strategies and it seems like the more books that Google scans, uh, the higher the prices can be. The entire thing transformed itself into a commercial enterprise. It's basically turned uh, this project into a bookstore rather than a library. Google argues it has no monopoly. It welcomes competition. Microsoft, Amazon and others could be doing the same thing but have decided not to. Microsoft used to have an initiative and they decided um, not to continue pursuing it. There's nothing we're doing that prevents anyone from doing the exact same thing. And the one thing that I strongly think is the wrong answer is that we should you know, lock all this stuff up so that nobody can discover them and nobody can, can use these books. Google's insistence it is acting altruistically, its reliance on its do no evil motto, drew scoffs from attorney Reback. People no longer see any big difference between Google and Google's competitors. They're in it for money, and we need to depend on the competitive system to protect us. Does that go for Amazon and Microsoft as well? It absolutely does. 
In this case, for example, Amazon was digitizing books long before Google was. Microsoft wanted to digitize books. Neither of them got the same deal that Google got, got secretly. But if they had, we'd be, all be better off because of it. Questions like those are being debated around the world. At Stanford, top librarians met recently to wrestle with how to adapt to the new online book resources and whether to cooperate with digitizations of their collections. And bookstores like Berkeley's Pegasus, already in competition with discount booksellers, have to adapt as well. This store now sells digital books through its website. Besides the competition from online books, store owner Amy Thomas also worries about the privacy of her digital book buyers. They have a right to read without being, um, having their reading records subpoenaed for whatever reason. They have a right to this privacy and we will hope that Google will maintain, zealously maintain, defend those rights. Pam Samuelson is equally skeptical of Google's privacy policies. She puts her trust in libraries. For its part, Google says it has been a huge advocate for user privacy. Antitrust concerns, copyright law, competition, and privacy are all at issue in a flurry of lawsuits, friend of the court briefs, and interest from the Department of Justice. They will come to a head in February when a federal judge holds a hearing on the Google case in New York. Well, I must say, uh, first of all, I, I totally... Uh, admire Google's mission statement. Uh, I think that it coincides with the mission of libraries, which is to get books to readers. So we're agreed on what the ultimate goal is. And furthermore, I agree with what's already been said, I think, by James Glick, that we are facing an extraordinary moment in world history, a moment when we really can make available to everyone in the world, practically, the world's literature. So if already Google has digitized 10, 12 million books, it's a fabulous asset. So I have nothing but enthusiasm for this and admiration for the way Google has gone about it. I mean, they have the technical expertise, the financial means, and they've got the sheer energy to create this thing. What gives me pause is the settlement itself. I mean, you could look upon it as a perfectly natural commercial deal in which the parties are dividing a pie. 37% goes to Google, 63% goes to the authors and the publishers. I think Google has every right to a return on its investment. And I think the authors have every right to a return on their copyright. So there's no quarrel there. But that really is a narrow view of the settlement as merely pie dividing. If you take a larger view, I think that really involves what you could call the whole digital future of the literary world. It's an extraordinary moment when the future of publishing, the book trade, reading, I would say the public good in general in cultural matters is at stake. So the stakes are very high. And if you take a step back and look at the settlement, which isn't easy because it's more than 300 pages of almost illegible legalese, but you step back and try to assess it, what is missing? Well, readers, libraries, the public or the public good. So it's not as if I'm opposed to the basic concept, but I think the settlement must be modified in a way that's going to take account of the interests of readers, libraries, and the public good. Now that's feasible. So how can we make it happen? I think that the revised version of the settlement does not make it happen. There are lots of problems, and I, could, I have a whole list of them, but the basic point is, this is a public asset. We uh, libraries have made available to Google, free, and collections that have been built up over generations at enormous cost. And now we're being asked 
to buy back the digitized version of those libraries at a fee that could be ruinously expensive. Now, Google has trying to keep the fee reasonable, and I hope it will. I mean, I trust their goodwill. But who will own Google a few years from now? Google has only existed since 1998. And the provisions in the settlement that govern pricing are not adequate to prevent what I would call price gouging. Libraries have suffered from being gouged for the prices of subscriptions to journals for many years. We are hurting in the world of libraries. And we must be extremely careful that this great asset will not be so expensive that we can't afford it. I really love walking through the stacks. All those books around me, they are incredible treasures. How many different works from how many different times in history that gives you a sort of a sense of awe. I'm Scott Dennis and I'm librarian for philosophy at the University of Michigan. History of Ecuador. This is acid paper from the 1880s. This is getting very brittle and this will eventually turn to dust. We were in danger of literally losing every copy of some of these books from the 19th century. Google went through all of this. I can walk through here now and we know that it's been preserved. Sort of the real power of Google Books is that it's intended to be really easy to use for any kind of person. They can just go on Google Books, search for a phrase or search for a word, and a whole world is opened up to them about that topic. Our mission statement as a whole company is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Having the power to search this huge collection of books from all across the world for this very specific information that you're looking for is pretty invaluable. Google Books really has democratized access. It's the power to bring all these vast resources and literally make them available to everyone, everywhere. Google Books goes on to change people's lives and affect the world. That's pretty profound.